Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Amma ba'd, fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. We are on hadith number 80, and in the chapter it's hadith number 7. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. An Abi Umara al-Bara'i ibn Azib. رضي الله عنهما قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا فلان إذا أويت إلى فراشك فقل اللهم أسلمت نفسي إليك ووجهت وجهي إليك وفوضت أمري إليك وألجأت ظهري إليك رغبة ورهبة إليك لا ملجأ ولا منجا منك إلا إليك آمنت بكتابك الذي أنزلت ونبيك الذي أرسلت فإنك إن مت من ليلتك مت على الفطرة وإن أصبحت أصبحت خيرا متفق عليه This hadith is narrated by Abu Umara al-Bara bin Azib رضي الله تعالى عنهما He said the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said O oh, Fulan, you are know, such a such person. When you retire to your bed, meaning when you go to bed, then say, Allahumma aslam tu nafsi ilayk, wa bajahtu wajhi ilayk, wa fawwattu amri ilayk, wa aljatu dhahri ilayk, raghbatan wa rahbatan ilayk, la malja'a wa la manja minka illa ilayk, amantu bi kitabika alladhi anzalta, wa nabiyika alladhi arsalta. Then, if you die that night, you will die upon fitra, meaning you will die upon tawheed and Islam. And if you wake up in the morning, then you will wake up in a good state. Well, uh, there's another narration, a variant, I'll mention that, then we'll come back to this dua. وفي رواية من في الصحيحين عنه قال قال لي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أتيت مضجعك فتوضأ وضوءك للصلاة ثم ثم اتجع على شقك الأيمن وقل وذكر نحوه ثم قال وجعلهن آخر ما تقول. So the second variant of this hadith is that uh, the the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said to me uh, when you approach your uh, bed then perform wudu like the wudu of prayer, then lie on your right side and say, and then the dua is mentioned. Then in the latter part of the hadith, it is said that the Prophet ﷺ said, so make it, meaning this dua, make it akhira ma taqul, the last thing that you say. So what is this dua? This is the dua the Prophet is, is instructing us to learn and to recite before we go to bed, before we go to sleep. And what's the virtue? What is the virtue of reciting this dua? That if you pass away in your sleep, you will pass away upon fitra. Which, what does fitra mean? You will pass away upon tawheed and Islam. And if you don't, you wake up in the morning, what will happen? Asbahta khayran, you will wake up in khair. You will wake up in a good state in the morning. So what is the translation of this dua? Allahumma aslam tu nafsi ilayk. O oh Allah, I surrender myself to you. I surrender, I give up myself to you. Wa wajahtu wajhi ilayk. And I turn my face to you. وَفَوَّطْتُ أَمْرِي إِلَيْكَ And I leave my matters to you. وَأَلْجَأْتُ ظَهْرِي إِلَيْكَ And I lean my back on you. Meaning I rely on you. رَغْبَةً وَرَهْبَةً إِلَيْكَ Out of fear and hope of you. لَا مَلْجَأَ وَلَا مَنْجَ مِنْكَ إِلَّا إِلَيْكَ there is no place to find security and run away from you except towards you. Amantu bi kitabika alladhi anzalta. I believe in your book which you revealed. 
And I believe in your Prophet who you sent. This is the translation of the dua. So our beloved Prophet وسلم, collecting these two hadith together is instructing us with three things that we should do before we go to sleep. Three things that we should do before we go to bed. Perform wudu the way you would perform wudu for salah. Number two, lie on your right side. And number three, recite this dua. Do this dhikr of Allah, this remembrance of Allah in the form of this dua. So that's the very first point of commentary. Our Prophet ﷺ is instructing us with these three etiquettes of going to sleep. The first is that you perform wudu. Uh, the way you would perform wudu for salah. So either this means you actually perform wudu and go to sleep or be in a state of wudu and then go to sleep. Inshallah later on, if you have read ahead in Riyadhu Salihin, there is a whole chapter about going to sleep and the manners of going to sleep. So when we get to that, we'll speak about this in more detail. Uh, but one of the wisdoms of performing wudu and then going to sleep is of course that if a person passes away in their sleep, they will meet, meet Malakul Maut, the angel of death. And how this is befitting for a believer to meet the angel of death whilst he or she is in a state of purification. Also, there is another hadith which mentions that uh, when you are in the state of wudu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's angels are protecting you. So if you sleep in the state of wudu, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send angels to protect you whilst you sleep. So the evil of human and jinn or, or of any other creature will not be able to reach you if you uh, fall asleep in a state of wudu. Of course, when you wake up, you, your wudu uh, has nullified, is invalid, but you're sleeping in the state of wudu. The second, the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to sleep on the right side. Kana uh, tayamun. The Prophet ﷺ loved to start with the right side. So for example, when the Prophet ﷺ would wear his blessed khufain, when the Prophet ﷺ would wear his um, socks, or leather socks, he would start with the right one first and the left one. When he would wear his blessed shoes, right one first and the left one. When he would put on his uh, kameez, or what we call in Urdu kameez, shirt, he would put the right side in first and then the left side. When the Prophet would comb his blessed hair, he would comb the right side first and then the left side. And some points even mention when he would oil his hair, he would oil his right eyebrow first and then his left eyebrow. So this is called tayamun, to start with the right. And the Prophet ﷺ loved to start with the right. Even when the Prophet ﷺ would be in a gathering of people, of Sahaba, when he would give something, he would always give to the right first. And when he would give something, he would give with the right hand. And when he would take, he would take with the right hand. This is called tayamun. So the Prophet ﷺ loved tayamun, preferred tayamun. So we, inshallah, tr would also try our best to act upon the sunnah. Uh, that doesn't mean that you sleep on your right side and that's it, you can't turn now onto any other side. Of course, you turn sides. You start off with your right side and try to sleep and then, of course, you move left and right and that's perfectly fine. But to st when you're in your bed and you intend to sleep, sleep on your right side. And this is the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. And then the third thing, when you go to bed, is this dua that you recite, this dhikr that you do, this remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, that we do. <coughs> so that's the first point regarding how we should, uh, the manners and etiquettes our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has instructed us to adopt. Now the actual dua, now the actual uh, supplication. O oh Allah, aslamtu nafsi ilayk. Aslamtu is made from the root word Islam. The root word is Islam. Then the, the verbs that are made from it, as, uh, aslamtu is a verb that is made from it. Muslim is a noun that is made from the word Islam. So Islam is to surrender 
to something and of course we know it means to surrender to Allah so this person uh, the the Muslim is instructed to say that oh Allah I surrender myself to you the question is don't we all surrender ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course we do no one would deny this we surrender ourselves to Allah why do we say this and there's a point I mentioned in the last dars in the last lecture at times we have to verbalize our thoughts and when we verbalize them they have a uh, a stronger impact on ourselves than just thinking. So we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides, but when we say Allah is the one who provides, this has a stronger impact on ourselves and on others. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is khayrul raziqeen, the best provider. But when we actually say it with our tongue, Wallahu khayrul raziqeen, that Allah is the best of providers. And you're saying with our tongue, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is sufficient for us and He is the best. Or how good is He to rely on? When we verbalize this, this has a stronger impact on ourselves. So these points we know, but we're verbalizing them before we go to sleep. So I surrender myself to you. What does that mean? <coughs> you are attesting and acknowledging that you have absolutely no power to do anything. That I have no power to do anything. Everything that I do is with your permission. When I intend to eat, you allow me to eat. You give me permission to eat. You create the action of eating and then you allow this to happen. So I surrender myself to you. I, ha I have absolutely no power. I cannot gain any benefit, nor can I protect myself from any harm. And this is the reality, isn't it? That we can't actually gain any benefit independent of Allah. Nor can we protect ourselves from any harm independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you say, Aslam tu nafsi ilayk, I surrender myself to you, you're acknowledging that, Oh Allah, I can't gain any benefit independent of you. And Oh Allah, I cannot protect myself from any harm independent of you. Any benefit I have gained is with your command and any, um, any tribulation or any problem that I have uh, that has been stopped has been by your command. Any difficulty that has uh, been prevented is by your command, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, thereafter, وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِ إِلَيْكَ وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِ إِلَيْكَ I turn my face to you. وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِ إِلَيْكَ And I turn my face towards you. وَفَوَّطُ أَمْرِي إِلَيْكَ And I leave my affairs to you. فَوَّطُ أَمْرِي إِلَيْكَ is exactly the same as saying أُفَوِّدُ أَمْرِي إِلَى اللَّهِ It's the same uh, words, just a uh, different uh, var variation of the word. Ufawidu amri ilallah, I leave my matter to Allah. Fawwatu amri ilayk, I leave my matter to you, Ya Allah. This word, fawwatu or ufawidu, is from the root word tafweed. It means to, to, to leave something to someone else. If you use it for other than Allah, it means to give another authority to do something over an act over an action, over a thing. But when we use it in regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does it mean? Oh Allah, I have surrendered myself to you. I turn to you. And I leave my affairs to you. Meaning, I know that everything is in your control. Oh Allah, I leave my affairs to you. Ibn Kamal alayhi rahma says, what this means is, you're saying, oh Allah, I rely on you. I rely on you, tawakkaltu alayk, in other words, I rely on you, and this is sufficient for me. Fawattu amri ilayk, I leave my matters to you, because before we sleep as humans, this is the time where we have disconnected from everyone. We have now disconnected from everyone, disconnected from work, disconnected from relatives, to such a degree you've disconnected from your own family. Now there's no one. 
it's just you it's time of sleep uh, Imam Badruddin al Aini, uh, when he comments on uh, the Mi'raj and he says why did the Mi'raj take place at night time and he says the night time is the time where the beloveds sit together the time of night is when you disconnect from everyone else and you're now with your beloved so that's the hikmah of this dua at this time because now you've disconnected from everyone else you are in your bed you are, it's time for sleep you've absolutely disconnected from everyone else and what are you saying when there's nobody there there's no person to hear you no person to know what you're thinking no one knows what you're thinking but there's there's no one there what are you saying oh allah i surrender myself to you oh allah i turn my face towards you oh allah these thoughts that are troubling me and I'm, i can't sleep i leave these in your court for what to amri ilayk i leave this to you wa alja'tu dhahri ilayk alja'tu is to lean dhahri my back ilayk i lean my back on you in other words i rely on you when you lean on something why do you lean on something to get strength ibn kamal says you lean on something to get strength you lean on something to get support so when you're saying oh allah i lean towards you i mean in the the most befitting way what you're saying is that you are the one who strengthens me and you are the one who comforts me i lean on you you are the one who strengthens me you are the one who gives me comfort ya allah Raghbatan wa rahbatan ilayk Out of Raghba and Rahba Out of um, Fear and hope All of this is out of fear and hope Yes I fear you but I'm also hopeful of you I'm fearful of your punishment And I'm hopeful of your reward La malja'a wa la munja minka illa ilayk La malja'a, meaning there is none to rely on. Wala manja, and there is none who can who I can run towards. There is no other place. In other words, there is no other place that I can go to. I have no place else except for you. The there is a famous poem. Um, I think it was Sheikh Abdullah Al Haddad wrote this poem where he speaks about his relationship as the servant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one of the lines is just a repetition of ma li siwak, ma li siwak, ma li siwak which means I have no one other than you I have no one other than you so that's what in the dua the Prophet sallallahu is teaching us to say that O oh Allah I have no one other than you I have no one other than you آمَنْتُ بِكِتَابِكَ الَّذِي أَنزَلْتَ I believe in your book which you revealed وَنَبِيِّكَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلْتَ and in your Prophet who you sent if a person recites this dua and then goes to sleep if they die in the sleep in mitta min laylatik if you if you die that night that you read this dua mitta ala al-fitra you will die upon fitra what is fitra? Uh, one commentary says fitra is the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Another commentary says fitra is your default nature of Tawheed and Islam. If you die that night, you have died on Islam. Wa in asbahta. However, if you wake up in the morning, asbahta khayran, you will wake up in a very good state. In a very good state. What does that mean? You will wake up, your day will be a good day, a day of Ibadah, a day of a'mal, saliha, good actions, if you are able to do this. So that was just an explanation of this dua. Uh, we as believers are instructed to regularly beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, I request all brothers and sisters, uh, what hadith number is this? 
hadith number 80 of Riyadh Salihin. Inshallah, if you have the book, then look at this. If not, you can find PDFs as, of this as well. Go to hadith number 80 and learn this dua and learn the translation of this dua and make this the last thing that you say. And I'm not saying this. The Prophet is saying this. Make it the last thing that you say. So this is what the Prophet is instructing us to do. Uh, this chapter of Tawakkul ends with uh, three supplications, if I remember correctly, yes. It ends with three supplications. So I want, I'll, there are some more commentaries when it comes to supplications and du'as, which I will mention uh, later, inshallah. So, let's move on to the next hadith and commentary, and I'll speak a bit more about du'a if I have time. A very beautiful du'a, a gift from our Prophet wasallam to us. And let's take advantage of this and advantage of the fact that we're here. Already we've done, uh, I think, two du'as already. One in uh, Babu Taqwa, the chapter of Taqwa, piety. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wal-tuqa wal-afafa wal-ghina. Then we've done another du'a. Allahumma inni laka aslamtu wa bika amantu wa alayka tawakkaltu wa ilayka anabtu wa bika khasamtu. Allahumma inni a'udhu bi'izzatika la ilaha. إلا أنت أن تضلني أنت الحي الذي لا يموت والجن والإنس يموتون. That's the two du'as that we've learned. I've literally learned them with you. I've, I did not know them from before. I didn't memorize them. I've been learning them alongside the dars. So it's easy to do that. If I give you five du'as and say learn these for next week, it's difficult. And after one whole year, we've got one du'a to learn. And after two dars, we have a second du'a to learn. So it's easy to do. So uh, take out time and memorize these supplications. The next hadith, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, An Abi Bakr al Siddiq, Radi Allah Ta'ala Anhu, Abdullah ibn Uthman ibn Amir ibn Umar ibn Ka'b ibn Sa'd, bin Taym ibn Murra, bin Ka'b ibn Luwey ibn Ghalib, al Qurashi al Taymi, Radi Allah Anhu, wa huwa wa abuhu wa ummuhu Sahaba, Radi Allah Anhum, Qal. نظرت إلى أقدام المشركين ونحن في الغار وهم على رؤوسنا فقلت يا رسول الله لو أن أحدهم نظر تحت قدميه لأبصرنا فقال صلى الله عليه وسلم ما ظنك يا أبا بكر باثنين الله ثالثهما متفق عليه This hadith is narrated by أفضل البشر بعد الأنبياء Sayyidina Abi Bakr in Siddiq radiallahu an Abdullah, the son of Usman, the son of Amir, the son of Umar, the son of Ka'ab, the son of Sa'ad, the son of Taym, the son of Murra, the son of Ka'ab, the son of Luway, the son of Ghalib, uh, Al-Qurashi al-Taymi, may Allah be pleased with him. Him, his father and his mother are all Sahaba. May Allah be pleased with them. He said, I look towards the feet of the mushrikeen, the polytheists, whilst we were in the cave and they were above our heads. And I said, O oh, Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if one of them looks towards his feet, certainly he will see us. Then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, O oh, Abu Bakr, what do you think about two people, the third of uh, the third of them is Allah. What do you think about such two people where their third company is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this is a hadith. This is actually the first hadith uh, where the narrator in Riyadh Salihin is Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now, if we do a discussion on Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, then this will last a very long time. Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiyallahu an, the first man uh, to accept Islam radiyallahu an, the first Khalifa, the first representative of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that Sahabi who's from the rare group of Sahaba where three generations have accepted Islam and three generations are Sahaba his son, himself and his parents three generations are Sahaba Having one person who is a Sahabi is enough of an honor. 
but he has three generations who have accepted Islam and our Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een so I'm not going to speak uh, about um, Hal al-Rawi the, the, the biography of the narrator may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be uh, pleased with him his, his parents his son and for their sake may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for all of our shortcomings in this hadith at the context of this hadith is Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the cave. Which cave? Do you remember? The cave of? The cave of Hijra, mashallah, which is called the cave of Thor. Ghar Thor or Ghar Thor. On the night of migration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam left Makkah al Mukarramah and rather than traveling north, the Prophet ﷺ went south and went to the cave and spent three nights in that cave. And then the Kuffar sent out um, search parties to search and capture the Prophet ﷺ. And they even put a bounty and said, the one who captures the Prophet ﷺ and brings him back to Mecca will be given a hundred, yes, a hundred red camels. Well done, Rizwan, mashallah. A hundred red camels and then search parties one after the other were traveling the route towards Medina traveling everywhere looking for um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it's a famous story so I do not intend to repeat that story in this narration the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq are both in the cave together and what happens the Kufara are uh, coming close they are coming close and Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that they are so close that all they have to do is look down towards their feet and they'll see us. If you've been, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us all to the Haramain, the blessed lands. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our eyes to see these and do ziyarat of these blessed places. If you see the cave of Thor, it's actually a cave where you have to go down to get into the cave. So it's not a cave where you walk in, you have to go down. So they were standing at a place where Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq says, if even one of them looked down towards his feet, he would see us. That's how close they were. But the Prophet wasallam then says to him, Oh Abu Bakr, what do you think about two such people where the third is Allah? And of course I'm going to explain what this means. So, first and foremost uh, in this hadith, what do we see? We see our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's bravery. Of course, these people are searching for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he is sitting in the cave, and he's uh, he's not worried. In fact, he is consoling his companion, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiyallahu taala anhu. The second thing we see is Kamal Tawakkul, a perfect Tawakkul of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Perfect reliance on Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He knows Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the one who commanded the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to leave. So you know the, the, the famous story of how the Hijrah began, where the of Mecca were sitting together to discuss how to, um, what to do about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how to stop the spread of Islam. And at that point, Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu and said that your Lord has now commanded you to migrate. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi knew Allah is the one who commanded me to migrate. Allah is my protector. Allah will protect me. So we see his bravery and we see Kamal al-Tawakkul, the perfect Tawakkul reliance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now imagine this. Someone is looking for you and they are right in front of you. All they have to do is look to one side and they'll see you. But the Prophet ﷺ knew Allah is going to protect us. And this was his tawakkul and reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the inheritance of the Muslims. This is a tawakkul that we should adopt in our daily practices, in our life. A dua is coming about how we should, when we leave the house in, in the morning, there's a dua the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has given to us. So before you go to sleep, there is a dua, which is about tawakkul. 
And when you leave your house in the morning, there is a dua which revolves around tawakkul. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then said to Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq that why are you worried? Why are you worried? What do you think about the state of two people when the third is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What does it mean Allahu thalithuhuma? What does that mean? That Allah is, Allah is a third of them means that Allah is the one who will give them victory. Allah is the one who will give them help. Bin Nasri wal Ma'unati. Allah is the one who will help them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will protect them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An Nahal verse 128 says, Inna Allah ma'al ladheena attaqaw wal ladheena hum muhsinoon. Certainly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those who have taqwa and those who have ihsan. Those who have piety, taqwa, and those who are muhsinun, who are good doers, who do good things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with them. So here we have Sayyidul Muttaqeen wa Sayyidul Muhsineen. The leader of all pious people, of all righteous people, and of all good doers. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the second best Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu so of course uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with them so this is something that we should remind ourselves if we are people of taqwa if we are people who try our best to fulfill the obligations try our best to stay away from the prohibitions then what fear do we have of anything in this world Whichever problem uh, we, uh, faces us, whichever trial or tribulation we may be in, remind yourself of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the shuja'a, the tawakkul, the uh, statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another thing we see is how our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives comfort to the hearts. Tatminuhu lil kulubi wan nufus. Tatmin is to give atminan, to give sukun and tranquility. We see how the Prophet is a person who gives people sukun, who gives people tranquility and calms people down. Not that, you know, some people, they'll see somebody who's angry, then they'll, they'll make them even more angry. They'll see that there's a, a fight. That, uh, uh, which is Im uh, imminent, a fight that might take place. So what they do is that they start to stir even more. So it's definitely a fight that's going to happen. Or there's ill feeling between two people. And then some Muslims, what they do, some people, what they do, is that they'll go and rather than uh, mend the ties, they'll put more um, rumors into the mix and distant the people even more. That's not the way of our Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you see somebody who is uneasy, if you see somebody who is anxious, if you see somebody, and you can tell from their face, it's not rocket science, you can see in a person's face that they might be upset, that there's something troubling them, that they might be in a state of anxiety. To act upon the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't say, I don't have time. Don't think, well, you know, I've got my own problems. What you should think is, I am a ummati of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm a follower of the Prophet ﷺ, and he would give sukoon and tranquility to those without. So I'm going to act upon this sunnah and I'm going to give my time and I'm going to listen to the problems of my brother, Muslim brother, Muslim sister and I will give them time. And just by talking, many times just by talking, a person will ease their load and be, uh, will enter a better mental and spiritual state. Also in this hadith, we see uh, the virtue of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. We see the virtue of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. He has been blessed to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa whilst there is no one else. He gave his wealth, he gave his uh, life. And he gave everything for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And these three nights, Sayyiduna Umar al-Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu 
would say to the Prophet uh, would say to Sayyidina Abu Bakr as Siddiq that, O oh, Abu Bakr, those three nights that you spent with the Prophet وسلم, give those three nights to me and I will give you my entire lifetime's worth of good deeds. Is an expression. It's an expression to say that if we have scales and I put my entire lifetime worth of good deeds on one side and we put your three nights with the Prophet ﷺ on one side, those three nights will outweigh my entire lifetime worth of good deeds and worship. Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and who is there to uh, uh, books upon books, uh, voluminous books upon books have been written in his virtue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him and for her, his sake may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, forgive us for our shortcomings. The next two hadiths are both supplications. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to recite both hadiths together. So hadith number 82 and hadith number 83 are both du'as, supplications. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عن أم المؤمنين أم سلمة رضي الله عنها أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان إذا خرج من بيته قال بسم الله توكلت على الله اللهم إني أعوذ بك أن أضل أو أضل أو أزل أو أزل أو أظلم أو أظلم أو أجهل أو يجهل علي حديث صحيح رواه أبو داود الترمذي this hadith is narrated by Umm al-Mu'mineen, Sayyidah Umm Salama radiallahu anha, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would, when he would leave his house, he would say, Bismillahi tawakkaltu ala Allah. Allah's name, I leave. I rely on Allah. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika. O oh Allah, I seek protection with you. An adilla o udal, that I... I'm to leave the path uh, uh, that I am to uh, move away or be moved away or, uh, or that I am to slip or cause to slip or that I oppress or am oppressed or that I do wrong or wrong is done to me. So this is a dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he would make. The next hadith عن أنس رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من قال يعني إذا خرج من بيته بسم الله توكلت على الله ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله يقال له هديت وكفيت ووقيت وتنحى عنه الشيطان رواه أبو داود والترمذي والنساء وغيرهم وقال الترمذي حديث حسن زاد أبو داود فيقول يعني الشيطان لشيطان آخر كيف لك برجل قد هدي وكفي ووقي. This hadith is narrated by Sayyidina Anas رضي الله عنه. He said, the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, whosoever says, meaning when he leaves his house. So whosoever when he leaves his house says, بسم الله توكلت على الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. Whosoever says this. Then it is said to him, Hudita, you have been guided. Kufita, you have been sufficed. Wabuqita, you have been protected. Watanaha anhu shaytan, and shaytan will go away from that person. In Abu Dawood's narration, he has an addition. And in his addition, one shaytan will say to the other shaytan, Kayfa laka bi rajulin qad hudiya wa kufiya wa kuqiya. How are you with somebody who has been guided, sufficed and protected? What's the point in other words? So if you recite this, then a shaitan will say to the other shaitan, Why are you with that person? He's been guided, sufficed and protected. Go to somebody else in other words. So in these two hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is t giving us a dua with two different wordings. One is simple. بسم الله توكلت على الله ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله which means Allah's name I begin with I rely on Allah لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله there is no power to allow me to do good and no ability and strength 
which can protect me from evil illa billah except from Allah this is a simple dua we should, we, to be honest you should all know this even by me reciting it once and then the, the previous dua is slightly longer when a person uh, leaves the house that time of leaving the house you are now going to come in contact with people and you know uh, your daily affairs whether this is meeting people in the street meeting friends meeting family going to work there's always a possibility of uh, many things can happen many things can happen so our beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has given us these supplications that when we leave in the morning for work for recreation for leisure to meet family for whatever reason when we leave our home it doesn't have to be in the morning whenever we leave our home to recite this dua and if you recite this dua what will happen it will be said what will be said that um, Hudita you have been guided so your daily routine when you have a choice of bad and good Hudita you have been guided your heart will incline towards good Kufita you have been sufficed meaning for your day there's nothing that will be empty there's nothing that will be left empty you will be sufficed and Wukita you have been protected now as um, a point to bear in mind this is past tense Hudita you have been guided past tense Kufita you have been sufficed past tense Wukita you have been protected past tense why has this been used if you're going out now I need protection now not in past tense I need it now this is um, used in Arabic language this is used in Arabic language where news of the future is given with a past tense verb to emphasize the certainty of the future tense and we do this in English as well we referring to the future we will use a past tense verb for example simple example Pakistan cricket team is playing who are they, who are they playing next? Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe. So, me and you are speaking about Pakistan versus Zimbabwe, and you say to me, GTA, <laughs> Pakistan GTA, which means they've won. But they haven't even played yet. But we use a past tense verb, haven't we? They've won. Why? To say, well, they're definitely going to win. So, we do this as well uh, in English language, use past tense verbs. They've won, even though they're going to play in a month's time. But we use this. So in this hadith, a past tense verb has been used. So you recite this dua, it will be said to you, you have been guided. You have been sufficed. You have been protected. Meaning now it's definite. You, you will be guided for your day. You will be sufficed for your day. You will be protected for your day. And that's the beauty and benefit of this dua. In fact, in Abu Dawood, one shaitan will say to the other shaitan, why are you even with that person? He's... He's been guided, he's been sufficed, and he's been protected. What are you doing with him? Meaning, you trying to misguide him is useless. If we leave with this mindset. So look how beautiful uh, this latter part of the chapter is. That in one hadith we have been taught, before you go to sleep, recite this. And with the dua of before going to sleep, I want to mention this point before it slips my mind. One thing that the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us with the dua before you go to sleep is Tajdeedul Ahad. Tajdeedul Ahad. Tajdeedul Ahad is renewing your promise. Renewing your promise. Ahad is a promise. We as believers have made a promise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have made a promise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of fulfilling our obligations and staying away from our prohibitions. When we recite this dua before we go to sleep, this is Tajdeedul Ahad. We're repeating and renewing. Um, you know, with, um, in the custom in the West, 
uh, uh, couples renew their wedding vows. They renew their wedding vows on, on their anniversary to repeat their vows that they made to each other. So when you go to sleep and you're renewing your ahad, what you're doing is you're renewing your vow that you made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, I uh, aslam to nafsi ilayk, I surrender myself to you. Wajah to wajhi ilayk, I turn my face to you. For what to amri ilayk, I leave my matter to you. So what you're doing is you're renewing your vow with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you go to sleep, you wake up, of course you read your salah, you get ready, and now you leave your house for your daily routine. What state do you leave? Bismillah tawakkaltu ala Allah. This is the state I leave my house. So when you go to sleep, you renew your vow, remind yourself of relying on Allah. And when you leave in the day or any time from your house, you remind yourself that you rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the final hadith. وَعَنْ أَنَسٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ What I'll do is I'll just recite this hadith and very brief commentary and we'll end our session today. It's the final hadith of the chapter. عَنْ أَنَسٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ قَالْ كَانَ أَخَوَانِ عَلَىٰ عَهْدِ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم وَكَانَ أَحَدُهُمَا يَأْتِ النَّبِيَّ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَالْآخَرُ يَحْتَرِفُ فَشَكَّ الْمُحْتَرِفُ أَخَاهُ لِلنَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال لعلك ترزق به رواه ترمذي بإسناد صحيح على شرط مسلم يحترف يكتسب ويتسبب This hadith is narrated by Sayyiduna Anas bin Malik رضي الله عنه He said that in the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم there were two brothers There were two brothers One of them would attend to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and the other one used to work. Then one day, the one who worked, the laboring brother, came to the Prophet and he complained about his brother to the Prophet ﷺ. So what did he complain? He's saying, Oh Prophet ﷺ, my brother's spending his time with you. And I'm, we're only two brothers, and I'm doing all the work. So I am earning the livelihood for our house. He's spending all of his time studying Islam with you whilst I'm working. So he's complaining. What did the Prophet say? La'allaka turzaku bihi. Maybe it is because of him that you are getting your sustenance. So the Prophet says to him that you're complaining that your brother is studying the deen, studying the religion, and he's not working to bring an income. And you're the sole provider of the house. But maybe it's the fact that he is the reason that you're being sustained. And there is a hadith of the Prophet wasallam that families or people are sustained because of the weak that are around them. That you people are given sustenance from Allah because of those weak people who are connected to you. So the more people that are connected to you and the more people that you have responsibility over, because of those people, Allah will give you more risk. So from this hadith we learn, when a, a man marries, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him more sustenance because now he has another person to look after. When Allah blesses them with children, Allah will give them even more sustenance. Think about it, those of you who do have children, Look at all the sustenance you have in your house. Well, that, that's more than what you need as a single person. But Allah has given all of that to you. Why? Because of your spouse. Because of your children. All of that for you. Why? Because of all those people who are depending on you. So likewise, the talibul ilm, the student of knowledge. If you have a student of knowledge in your house, or if you are connected to a student of knowledge, the hadith is teaching you, support that student of knowledge. If that student of knowledge is an immediate family member, then you are very fortunate. That maybe it's due to the fact that that student of knowledge is your family member, that your entire family is being sustained. So from the final hadith of the Prophet wasallam, these were some points. If there are any more uh, that I want to mention, I'll mention them in our next session. If not, then we'll move on to our next chapter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
accept what we have learnt and give us the ability to implement this. Amin bijahi nabi.